Board your ships and prepare for adventure in Miraheim as we get ready to review Quests and Cannons, The Risen Islands. Quests and Cannons is a high seas adventure game for two to six players. In it, players take on the role of a captain representing one of the great nations of Miraheim, sailing the seas and exploring newly risen islands for exploitable resources and quests. But there are other captains seeking the same goals, and only one can claim the most prosperity for their people. I want to thank Eric for sending me a copy of the game to review. I'm really excited to check this one out. It promises to be a bridge between kind of those complex games that I typically like to play versus maybe the lighter games that you know more casual players like. So it'll be neat to see if it does deliver on that promise. So what we'll do now is we'll take a look at the mechanics, see how the game plays, and then I'll go ahead and give my thoughts on it. Uh, one thing to note, uh, this is a prototype copy, so uh, expect the components and uh, things that are delivered in the final version of the game to be maybe slightly different than what you see on the video today. To set up a game of quests and cannons, you begin by assembling the board. You start this by constructing the outer ring, and from there you lay out a series of hexes until the board is full. The game manual contains different layouts of the hexes depending on the number of players you're playing with and the type of game you're playing. Once the board is built, you will then lay out the island feature tokens randomly, with one being placed on each named island space. After all the island feature tokens have been placed, you will then put a score tracker on each scoring path on the outer ring of the board, and then you will shuffle and place each deck of cards in an associated spot on the outer ring as well. With the board assembled, each player will now set up their play area. Everyone receives a ship player board, as well as a character insert representing the captain that they will be playing in the game. Players will then take their sail, cannon, and cargo space tokens as indicated on their captain insert. In this example with L-Wing Songfeather, she will begin with one sail, one cannon, and three available cargo spaces. From here, players will take their corresponding player piece, and then five ammo dice, three coins, and a six-sided traveler die, as well as an action point tracker for their board. From there, each player will draw a starting map clue, and then you are ready to begin your game of quests and cannons. On their turn, a player receives three action points that they can use to perform various actions in the game. You can spend one action point to move one adjacent space on the board, and you can spend as many action points as you'd like on a turn for movement. Additionally, when moving, you can use one or more of your sails to increase your movement by one space per sail used. There are various types of spaces present on the board. There's calm seas, which just simply count as one space for movement. There are stormy seas, which count as two spaces. The named island spaces contain the feature question mark tokens and will be where you obtain many of the resources you'll use in the game. Treacherous sea spaces count as one space for movement, however they do require a player to use their traveler die in order to avoid a penalty when moving through them. Outpost spaces allow players to upgrade or repair their ships, stock up on ammo, complete quests, and sell their resources, loot, or map clues. Trading posts allow players to trade their resources for other resources in the game, as well as obtaining loot cards or map clues from the respective decks. Additionally, players can also sell their resources, loot, or map clues just like at an outpost. The starting spaces on the board allow players to repair their ships, stock up on ammo, and sell the resources, loot, and map clues that they have similar to the outpost. When a player ends their move action on a named island, they will reveal that island's feature token. Once revealed, players can take the gather action on any island space with a revealed token. This action allows the player to collect resources of the matching type and can collect as many as they want that will fit into their open cargo hold spaces. The third main action players can take is the attack action. If a player ends their move in a space with a rival ship, they may fire their cannons. To do this, a player will spend one action point and fire as many cannons on their ship as they'd like. For each cannon fired, they will flip over their available cannon token to its fired side, and they will collect an ammo die for each cannon being fired. The player will then roll those dice, and for every four pips displayed, will deal one damage to their opponent's ship. Damage is recorded on the captain's insert by placing a damage token over an available heart space. Play continues in this fashion, with players moving around the board, collecting resources, and attempting to collect victory points via quest cards, map clues, and other items. 
Once a player reaches a predetermined victory point total based on the scenario being played, all other players will have one final turn to attempt to collect points. Whoever ends with the most points wins the game. Does the game bridge that complexity gap? Can you get this in front of casual folks while also entertaining your, your core kind of strategic game players? Uh, it does. It bridges that very well. The game is easy to teach. It's easy to kind of get on the table in front of casual people. It's not going to overwhelm them with a lot of rules or terminology that they're not going to be familiar with. However, it does have that complexity and that strategic depth that's going to really entertain your core gamers. It's, it's a fun game to play. I enjoy playing it, but it's not going to intimidate the casual people in my life that I do play games with. So in that account, it wins uh, and it succeeds in exactly what it was trying to do. Another thing that works really well is the world building, the, the story that this game tells. Um, there's a lot of really interesting elements to this that I want to learn more about and I want to explore in the game. Uh, the designers have talked about how this is, you know, the first part in potentially other games coming out that further explore this world. And that gets me excited for it because I'm not playing a generic naval game. I'm, I'm exploring the world of Miraheim and just really investing myself into this just by playing a simple board game which is very hard to do and i feel some games try for that and you know maybe stumble a little but quest and cannons really does invest you in that world where you want to see what's beyond the next island you want to find out you know what that next quest is going to give to you Another thing I like, uh, it kind of relates to the first two pieces of this, is just the component design and the decisions they made in this game. I love these player boards. I love the ship design, and it really invests you in the story. It invests you in the world and in the gameplay, too, because when you're exploring these islands, when you're gathering resources, you're actually putting resource tokens like in the hold of your ship. And you, you know, you have cannons and you're flipping your sails over when you want to, you know, move further on the board. You're actually interacting with your player board that makes it feel like you're, you know, piloting a ship uh, as much as any game can do that. And I really think it does it well. You know, some games try to do that with their mechanics or with their design and they can fall a little flat. And I think Quest and Cannons really nails that feeling of being kind of in charge of your ship because you're actively manipulating these objects and these pieces in the game that you're playing, which again, just invests you in that story and in that world. You, you feel like you're piloting that ship yourself, which is just really cool. One thing I'll note, uh, it's a, a little bit of a stumble, more of a pro and a con, is the map setup. Um, there are four pages in the rulebook solely devoted to how you set up the map for this game. Um, so it can be a little, uh, I guess, I don't want to say time consuming. Setting up any board game can take time, but it just feels a little extra complex for uh, a game that is otherwise pretty straightforward. The pro of this and the, the flip side is the fact that it's because the game allows for a varied player count, um, different game modes, solo and co-op and what have you. So again, it's not a bad thing. It just feels like, I don't know, maybe if there were fewer tiles that were larger, it would have streamlined that uh, setup piece or but maybe you would have lost that flexibility i i don't know um it's definitely not a deal breaker it's more just something that kind of you know stood out to me as i'm playing this very you know well thought out and designed game but then i'm sitting here you know bent over a map trying to figure out did i place this hex in the right spot so again not a deal breaker but something to keep in mind final thoughts on the game i really like quests and cannons I think it works well. It's a very well-designed game with a lot of great story building and gameplay design and concepts. And it all just, it meshes well to create this game that can appeal to a broad audience of players, both casual and hardcore, in a manner that really sucks you in and makes you want to play the game, to explore this world of Miraheim and just see what it has to offer. So again, I can't recommend this game enough. And uh, otherwise, as always, please, you know, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more like this, and I will see you all next time. Thanks.